All right, hello. Welcome to the Coastal Hazards and Climate Resilience webinar. Thank you so much for sharing your lunch hour with us. As I've mentioned, everyone is in listen-only mode and the webinar is being recorded. My name is Abby Wakely and I'm the Communications Director of Socora. We are very excited to team up with the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership, also known as SCDRP, to host this webinar as part of our Socora 2020 virtual annual meeting. This is, since everyone is in listen-only mode, I'm gonna pass it off to Brett Burke to give an overview of the technology before getting started. Hi, everybody. So uh, again, because you're in listen-only mode, um, please, uh, we have a big question and answer session at the end. And so as questions occur to you, please go to your GoToWebinar control panel and type your questions into the questions function. There's also a chat function um, and that's a great uh, function for using or for uh, reaching out to others that are on the webinar. Uh, but if you're uh, if you're asking a question of the panel, we ask that you use the questions section because that's the one that we'll be monitoring for for those type of types of questions. And for the panelists, a reminder to put yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and that's it. The video will be uh, produced from this later for uh, for Sequoia's use. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Brett, for the overview. Um, I just wanna quickly introduce Sakura, then I'll pass it off to Barbara Bischoff, the director of SCDRP. She'll be kicking off the webinar and moderating the session today. So Brett, next slide. Sakura is the Regional Coastal Ocean Observing System for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We are one of 11 that make up the NOAA-led U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, also known as U.S. IUS. Next slide. Our mission is to sustain and promote observations that help keep you safe. This is a quick snapshot of the technology we support to accomplish our mission. All right, next slide. And Barbara, you can go ahead and take over. Thanks so much. Abby. Um, so just a brief introduction about the Southeastern Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership. We're an affiliate program of Socora, and we're comprised of a group of individuals from public, private, academic, and nonprofit organizations, which focus on solving challenges um, in disaster recovery planning and resiliency in the communities across the Southeast and U.S. Caribbean. Um, the SCDRP is distinctive, I would say, in that its network focuses on the region's resilience challenges and climate adaptation priorities, and is pretty much unconstrained by sector or industry. Our approximate 150 participants can boast a broad range of expertise and disciplines and serve in many different roles. We convene regularly to share information on pressing issues and challenges in recovery and resilience activities and work together to leverage resources to develop best practices that enhance whole community preparedness and resilience. So we are fortunate to be part of this Sakura network and um, able to participate in today's webinar, which is why we're all here, so let's get started. Um, first, to remind you, you are in listen mode only. You are welcome and encouraged to type your questions in the Q&A box in your control panel, and we'll relay these to our guests after their presentations. So again, a reminder um, that you are being recorded. This is being recorded today, and we will hopefully post this on the Socora and the SCDRP websites um, for folks who couldn't join us today. So um, let's get to our presentations. We're excited to bring you three speakers who will talk about climate data and ways in which we can apply such data to enhance community resilience. So first we'll hear from Dr. Gary Mitchum. Dr. Mitchum is a professor of physical oceanography and the associate dean in the College of Marine Science at the University of South Florida. His research interests primarily emphasize short-term climate variability, ranging from seasonal to interannual changes to sea level rise on the scales of decades to a century. We'll then hear from Dr. Cartman, Ben Cartman, who has since 2007 been the director of the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies, or CMIS for short, at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, and also serves at this, as the deputy director of UM's Institute for Data Science and Computing. Dr. Cartman focuses on understanding and predicting climate variabilities on time scales of days to decades, and will present some of his work on flood predictions here today. 
And finally, we'll hear from Jan McKinnon, who is a program manager and biologist with the Georgia Coastal Management Program, which is housed within the Department of Natural Resources and Coastal Resources Division in Georgia. Um, Ms. McKinnon has been with the Georgia DNR for about 21 years, where she works with researchers, locals, local communities, agency partners, and the public to implement projects that enhance community resilience through conserving natural and living resources. So um, please note that their full bios are on the website. You can learn more about these folks there. And um, Gary, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Barbara. Let me bring my screen up. Brett, is that okay? It's perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you all, welcome everyone. I'm going to um, start out by telling you a little bit about what the Ben and I both are gonna talk about. Don't mean to horn in on Ben, but we gave a back-to-back -back, um, presentations at a climate summit that Ben organized recently in Miami, and we thought it went pretty well. So we're going to reprise that today, but um, in a shorter format. So I'm sure that Ben has made his much better and improved and mine is simply shorter. So the topic that we're gonna be talking about is, um, as it Ben hinted at in his, in his bio, is coastal flooding. And, but we're talking more about coastal flooding due to high tide flooding and um, ocean atmosphere variability. And my role here is I'm going to raise, give some background on a few kind of outstanding research issues that I think are um, very important for us to understand. And then Ben is gonna to talk to you more about specific things that he's doing to develop um, coastal flooding predictions. So moving on then, the, this is a flood day, flooding days projection tool that was developed. There was a paper published in um, JGR was developed by my former graduate student, actually. I'm very proud of him. He's Phil Thompson, University of Hawaii, director of the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. And what you're seeing here is we pick a threshold and we call that a, a flooding day. And we count the number of days per year. And this is out from until the year 2050. So we do projections. And the general increase over time is due to sea level rise. The um, you notice here, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but you notice here you have times of steeper rise, flatter, and then steeper again and flatter. Um, this is partly due to the modulations of the tides. So over the nodal period or the roughly 20 year sort of cycle. The scatter, the width of the curve is due to ocean atmosphere variability. You know, those are specific to um, each particular tide gauge. So those are the three things I wanna to mention today. First of all, um, I'll tell you what I'm gonna tell you. If these um, don't sound interesting, you can um, log off and wait for Ben's talk. Um, sea level rise is the key for the long-term predict project, uh, predictions. And that projection, being able to project that depends on what society does for mitigation. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. The main point I'm gonna tell you about the tidal signals is that I've been doing tidal analysis for a long time, since the mid eighties. And it turns out this is a little more difficult than I expected. So I'll just um, basically point that out to you. If you're gonna do this, you might want to engage a tide expert. The ocean atmosphere variability, I'm gonna also say is a very difficult problem. And Ben will say a lot more about that. A lot of research to be done. The First thing is the sea level rise rate is accelerating. We have to take this into account in our projections. Uh, first of all, there was a paper about a um, year and a half or so ago, uh, Steve Neerum, I was one of the co-authors as well, that using the satellite altimetry sea level record, global mean sea level, over the past 25 years, you can see the black curve, smooth curve fit to the altimetry data. This is a quadratic curve, in other words, an accelerating curve. And we have shown from the data directly for the first time that this curve is significantly different from a non-accelerating curve. And in addition, it's consistent with the IPCC um, 
projections, the intermediate projections. We have to take into account acceleration, in other words. From the longer tide gauge records, I have a paper in, in preparation from a, my last PhD student's record. We did something a little differently. We used the long-term tide gauge records over a longer time period, but noisier. And we fit a variety of models to these that were either accelerating or non-accelerating, variety of different ones. What we showed is that we can't tell you specifically what the shape of the acceleration is, but we can definitely eliminate the idea of non-accelerating models. You have to allow for acceleration to be consistent with the data. Going back to this um, flooding tool that I was talking to Phil about, again, if you can see the pointer from 2020 to 2025, this is for, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, this is for the tide gauge at St. Petersburg. It was chosen because that's where I live, and that's where my house floods. So I um, have a vested interest here. 2025 to, 20 to 2020 to 2025, the number of days is about doubling. And that's um, primarily due to the fact that we're getting into a time period where the spring neap tide differences are at a maximum in the 20 year cycle. So the tides here are gonna be very, very important over the next decade or two for determining how many flooding days we expect. And we're working with the city here. We have a project with NOAA working with the city here to try to do projections on these kind of timescales for the city, for their infrastructure planning. And then we see of 2025 to 2030 flattens, but then starts accelerating again. So in the tide prediction part, we think of the um, tide predictions as easy. Well, in fact, it's it's not so easy. And again, I don't have time to get into that today in the 12-minute version of the talk, but um, I'm just suggesting that if you want to try to do the sorts of things that Phil did on your own, um, check with a tide model, a tide expert. You know, there are many ways to make a, a boo-boo on that. Scatter that we see in this curve, the in the, that top curve, the red bar around the red line. Now, this is due to the ocean atmosphere signals. And this is also, I think, not such an easy problem, definitely a, a research problem. I'm not going to say a lot more than that because Ben is going to be talking about it. But I will give one example I, that I think is an area that we all need to be doing a lot of work on now. This is the idea of what is the force signal due to the increase in greenhouse um, gas concentration. We'll call that the forced signal. And what part is the normal ocean atmosphere variability? So even without greenhouse forcing, we have variability. Things like El Nino, for example, is the example I'll give you. Um, these two are linked, but I picked out two papers. These are all good friends of mine, so I'm not um, trying to pick on anybody. But I want to show you something that I think st shows that we're in a state of some confusion. Uh, Steve Neerum and John Fasulo um, had a paper recently showing that the pat arguing that the pattern that we're seeing due to the forced signal is actually looks like the El Nino, that arguing essentially that the forced signal is essentially a, an extended El Nino, which other people have discussed as well. Um, after that, even more recently, uh, Mike Mann uh, with co-authors did another analysis and concluded that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation, could not be distinguished from noise. Okay, So there was no need for any forced signal at all. Uh, this leaves me with uh, what, what am I supposed to think about this? So I think this is an area where we really need to um, think more carefully about it. And variability and forcing are dynamically are going to be linked. Changes in the uh, forcing is going to affect the mean state, which could be interpreted as variability wrongly, or it could also change the variability, which is a, a second order sort of effect. Uh, so one example, that I gave in the other talk, I'm just gonna do this very quickly, is that El Nino, we understand, is when the energetics is such that the system changes to a low energy um, state. El Nino is a low energy state. 
if we think very simply about the climate system, one possibility of reducing the temperature gradient from the equator to the poles is that we might reduce the energy in the mean state. So then we have the issue of if we see an El Nino-like pattern that Steve Naram and John Fasillo were talking about, are we seeing a change in El Nino or are we seeing a change in the mean state or some combination of, the bo of both of them? And I'm going to um, just leave it with the take-home fact, take-homes again. Sea level rise is the key to determining the changes over decades to the century sort of level. And again, the projections that we make are only as good as our ability to project the emissions. And that depends on what we do in terms of mitigation. Um, on a time scale of you know, seasonal to interannual, we can be in a different um, background state depending on the tides, the range of the, basically how high are the spring tides. And that changes on the nodal period 18.6 year, roughly 20 year period. And those computations at an individual tide gauge, I just want to warn you, are a little more difficult than you might expect. Um, ocean atmosphere variability, I said a few things about that and I'm gonna leave that there because Ben will be saying a lot more about that. Ben, I hope you haven't changed your talk and none of this replies to you anymore, but I think I'll leave it at that and um, carry on with Ben. Thanks, Gary. No, that's um, that's a great lead-in. So um, I really appreciate that introduction that Gary's made. Um, hopefully, there. Hopefully, that's working. Perfect for everybody. So um, what I want to talk about today a little bit is you know, moving towards a coastal flood risk prediction system from days to decades, and. Um, if I don't get through all my slides, uh, I apologize, and but but I don't mind. So um, uh, if you have more questions, I'll be sure, I'll be sure and happy to address them. Uh, Gary really laid out very very carefully what I view as the chronic problem. The chronic problem is these trends that we're dealing with of sea level rise that are highly dependent upon human activities in terms of CO2 emissions and also mitigation strategies, but they tend to evolve fairly slow. And you have to consider, of course. Uh, the tides is part of that, the 20-year cycle that Gary talked about. What I'm going to talk about mostly today is the acute problem. And so this graph that I'm showing you over here, these two graphs, uh, this is from Key West. This is going back into the uh, early 1900s all the way through the present. And what this curve is showing you is the, the trend in the, in, in the Key West tides. And it has a linear fit on that. And Gary's already told us that that linear fit is going forward uh, uh, well into the future is not appropriate. That's that acceleration, so you have to have a curve bend. And the bottom curve is removing that trend from the time series. So it's just leaving the fluctuations. And these fluctuations, uh, these day-to-day, season-to-season, year-to-year fluctuations are largely driven by ocean-atmosphere interactions. And it's these day-to-day -day fluctuations, the acute. So if you look at the very end of the time series, you see some you know, extreme flooding. And it's these acute stream, extreme flooding events that are sort of the day-to-day -day fluctuations superimposed on that chronic trend that uh, Gary talked about. And that's, and that's really what I want to talk about is how can we, how can we predict that acute uh, flooding risk? So can I say something about how often it's going to flood next October or how often it's going to flood next March, for example, or how often it's going to flood in my neighborhood three weeks from today? And that's, so that's what I largely think about and what I want to talk about. To do that, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about what's driving these regional changes of sea level. So I'll mention some of those issues. And one thing that we're learning when you think about this acute, this acute problem, while that chronic problem is in the background and you have to account for it, it's not always a good predictor of when you're going to get a flood. And so I'll show you some of that. And uh, then the last thing I want to talk about is can we do better? So what are the research questions and what are the tools that we, we need to further develop in order to make better predictions? So what causes uh, re regional sea level change? So Gary talked very carefully, very uh, completely about this notion of uh, greenhouse gas emissions warming the climate system. Uh, when the climate system warms, the oceans warm up, thermal expansion, sea level rise, ice sheets melt. That also adds mass to the ocean, sea level rises. 
when we start to think regionally, there are lots of other things that can affect uh, 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 regional sea level. So the first one we want to think about, uh, the one I want to talk about anyways, is the Gulf Stream. So off the coast of uh, North America, off the coast of Florida, if the Gulf Stream is really strong, that tends to suppress sea level. If the Gulf Stream weakens, that tends to increase sea level. The Gulf Stream has these natural fluctuations that are due to oceanography and, and atmospheric sciences, the air-sea interactions associated with the climate system. But as Gary mentioned very carefully, there's compounding effects. So in addition to that natural variability, there are trends in the strength of the Gulf Stream. So we think there's evidence that might be, the Gulf Stream might be weakening that could further enhance regional sea level compared to the global trend. And of course, there's freshwater input, melting glaciers, uh, more precipitation and evaporation that all adds mass to the ocean, which causes additional sea level. As the climate warms, glaciers melt. And just a little unfun fact is that 95% um, of the world's uh, land ice glaciers are melting. If the climate system was some kind of equilibrium, half would be melting and, and half would be growing, but 95% of them are melting. And then, of course, there's just the straight steric effects that we've already mentioned. If you warm the ocean, it's just it's your intuition. It's just gas it expands. And so it takes out more space, sea level rise. And of course, we can't forget about land substance, land sinks. In fact, in, in Miami Beach, this is kind of a, a significant contributor. And so this picture that I'm showing you off on the right-hand side is just trying to decompose the sea level we've seen in, in Key West up to, fit, up to 2050, what we expect that to be and what has been in the past due to the, all these various effects. And of course, the ones I'm worried about are what's labeled here as ocean circulation, but it also involves atmosphere ocean interactions. Okay, so what I what what you sort of think is this sea level, this sea level uh, that this chronic sea level problem is not always the best indicator of uh, floods, and the reason it's not always the best indicator of floods is there are other things going on in the climate system that can affect whether you have that water in the ocean come up in land. Uh, and the other possibilities, the dominant one that I'm gonna show you, at least on the Eastern Seaboard, in these shorter timescales. Again, emphasizing you know, what's gonna happen a few weeks from today, a few months, maybe out to a year or so, is the winds. So if the winds are more onshore and the sea level has risen, that's gonna push more water onshore, that's gonna create more flooding. So storms going by can give you this acute problem over the near term. Over longer terms, you know, you could have a season or a month where the winds are more onshore than they were normal. That will also give an increased flood risk. So the question I'm asking is, can we understand these things? And if we can understand these things, can we, can we predict these things? And so this is based on uh, observational data. It's, a, it's really very simple figure, and it's just looking at the highest water levels in two locations. One is Norfolk, Virginia, and the other is uh, San Francisco, California. And what you notice is there's a shift. There's a shift to higher probability of higher water levels, a significant shift during El Nino events, during El Nino events. And so in San Francisco, that's actually primarily caused, although partly contributed to by the winds, that's primarily caused during, uh, due to a sea surface height effect, a rising sea level that's part of the El Nino system. I'm gonna show you a picture of this in a minute to get a better feel for it. In Norfolk, however, right, you still have that El Nino connection, but it's not direct through the ocean. It's actually that El Nino changes the weather patterns around the world. And it changes that our winds become more onshore in Norfolk, Virginia, and that causes increased flood risk. And that can persist for several months. So let me just show you a little, a, a slightly better picture of this. And uh, the organizers have to tell me when I've talked too long because I forgot when I started. So as usual, I battle away. So anyways, this is a prediction, a, a picture of what sea level looked like, the height of the ocean surface throughout the region of North America and the surrounding oceans during one of the biggest El Ninos we had on record. So that big blob of high high sea surface height that you see in the tropical Pacific, that's El Nino. 
that's the big El Nino. And you can see it just spreads along the coast of, of North America, of Western North America, and it gives uh, flooding along the coast. I grew up in Santa Barbara, California, and we had extreme flooding uh, always during this, these El Ninos. And the 97, 98 El Nino was no exception. And that's in large part due to uh, that rising sea level as part of this El Nino system, which is a natural part of our climate system that we think we can predict. The second about picture- three, About three minutes, Ben. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brett. Of, of course, I've battled along and I'm not even close to finishing my slide. So I'm just gonna uh, uh, finish this story and then jump to the end. So uh, this other picture, this other picture is showing changes in the winds. So it's not the total wind, it's how the wind has changed during the El Nino. And what you can see, what you can nicely see is uh, along California, you know, along the west coast of the U.S., the winds are much more onshore. So when you have that increased sea level due to El Nino, more onshore winds, you increase the flood risk. Yeah, much more interesting and challenging picture uh, on the, along the eastern seaboard, where you see, you know, basically in north of Virginia, north, more onshore winds that's due to El Nino, and then further to the south, you actually see more offshore winds in Florida, and you can see. If you just looked at the sea level picture at Norfolk, Virginia, it's almost zero. It's almost right at that node line. It's almost zero. So you wouldn't expect uh, uh, much effect uh, due to just the sea level uh, during this big El Nino. But you do see lots of flooding in Norfolk, and that's because these changes in the winds. And so I have all these wonderful pictures that if uh, you ever have a chance to come to my lab, I can show you. Uh, that show our attempts to try to predict that going forward in the future. And one of the tools we use to try to predict that effect is realistic models, these models of the climate system. And what I want to show you here is uh, a concern I have uh, about how we project uh, the climate going forward and how we do these projections. So this is just showing you the surface current speeds from a, a typical climate system model that's used in our projections of what the future would look like 20 years, 30 years, 100 years going into the future, this left-hand panel. So these are anemic looking currents. On the right-hand panel is showing you what a more state-of-the-art model that sort of resolves the Gulf Stream produces in terms of surface currents, something much more realistic. And what I would argue is that when we start thinking about predictions and projections, as, as Gary notes, how challenging the ocean atmosphere interaction problem is, we need to start using tools to do a better job of representing that interaction. And the Gulf Stream here locally is so important for getting our sea level rise right and our natural variability right, acute flooding, we need to do a better job of that. And with, with that, I'll end. Uh, we've used it, this picture on the right is just uh, our attempt to use that model to look at trends, regional trends, and you can see it makes a big difference in terms of regional trends of a sea level when you use a model that that represents the Gulf Stream. You can even see an imprint of the Gulf Stream in that picture. And so uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll make, uh, Jan, we're making you presenter now. Okay, how about that, Brett? Can you see my slide? Wonderful. I just wanted to um, first thank SCDRP and Socorro for having me today and Ben and Gary for setting uh, the stage for what I'm going to talk about, which is going to be quite different, uh, less data heavy, but more application, uh, more of what we are faced with day to day as coastal managers and how we look at resiliency and how we implement changes on the ground that uh, we hope are going to fit the mission of resiliency using data sets um, as described by both Ben and Gary in their presentations. So first of all, I wanted to give a shout out to, um, to our program. Uh, we are one of the NOAA-funded coastal zone management programs, and as Barbara mentioned, we are housed within the Department of Natural Resources here in Georgia. And um, what you see here is a pinwheel of our areas of service. And what I really like about this is that it really highlights how diverse our program is in working uh, to fund projects, whether it be the latest and greatest science or um, specific research to address specific problems. 
Um, we also develop training and tools and a lot of the data um, comes into play there as well. <clears throat> we host events, we do a lot of work with our communities um, in various ways. And part of that is, is hazard resiliency, disaster preparedness. We also have our own monitoring programs, um, but we also, as mentioned, we feed uh, research through um, funding. And then we do an awful lot of government coordination um, in various ways, local, state, and federal levels. And I'll talk about some of those today. And then we do have a regulatory capacity and compliance and enforcement within our program. So resiliency for us really fits into our mission of balancing development with the protection of our natural resources. And so what I wanted to focus on today are just really three target audiences that uh, I'll share some, some stories of um, three target audiences that we work with. Uh, one example of living shorelines with public and private property owners, um, and also partnership with the Army Corps of Engineer. Engineers, our thin layer placement project, and then I'll end with a, an example of a local government coordination project, which involves dune enhancement and creation. All of these projects are very dependent upon data, whether it be shoreline change information, uh, bathymetry data um, is a huge need, both near shore, offshore, and back barrier island tidal creek systems, um, LIDAR and ortho imagery, um, and also more and more important to us um, going into the future is going to be sand sourcing. So I won't um, spend too much time on this. This is uh, data from our Fort Pulaski gauge um, in the Savannah River showing a relative sea level trend of 3.25 millimeters per year, very similar to what Gary showed for Florida. But I do want to look at this graph a little bit more closely. This is um, from my colleague Jason Lee and Wildlife Resources Division, which shows the number of extreme tides per year based off of Pulaski data. And he arbitrarily chose five to six feet mean sea level because of the approximate elevations of marsh to upland interface. And so when you look at the five foot mean sea level um, trend, it's quite shocking to me. And it really does show what we are seeing on the ground, which looks like this. And a lot of folks on this call are familiar with the US, US 80 uh, road to Tybee Island, the flooding in the top left corner. Um, but the others are um, reminders of these ever-changing environments that really go back to that Pulaski data set. At the bottom left, you can see shoreline change information here from Dr. Chester Jackson at Georgia Southern. I think it's a great reminder of how dynamic our coastal systems are. This is showing from the 1800s all the way to the early 2000s. And then um, on the ground, on, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, this is a picture I took last year after a supermoon tide event just outside of our office. And for those of you that are in the field quite a bit, um, you do notice these changes over time. And this really caught my attention because you could just see the sheer velocity of water moving out of a tiny little tributary into the marsh and how much sediment it was taking with it. Um, so just a reminder of the ever-changing environments, um, which really prompt citizens to call us when they are seeing these changes. So one of the ways that we have addressed resiliency uh, for the last 15 years or so is looking at our estuarine shorelines, our tidal creeks, which are traditionally armored with bulkheads or rock revetments. And our goal has been over this period of time to really add a tool in the toolbox for property owners to be able to stabilize their shorelines. They are allowed under law to stabilize and protect their investments. And so we wanted to explore different techniques that would continue to offer habitat value while at the same time achieving um, abatement of, of erosion, which is their intent and mission all along. So uh, we started developing um, the first pilot projects uh, in Georgia 
and constructed projects on Sapelo Island. Um, the picture on the left, as you see, is, is typical erosion for, um, for coastal Georgia. I would say this property owner was losing about three feet per year. And this is state property, so it was a great place to put a demo site. One of the things I failed to mention earlier is that with so many of our resiliency projects, we um, intend to monitor them to make sure that we are truly um, achieving the goals that we set out to achieve. So this is no different. Um, we did monitor the habitats, um, primarily oyster growth at these sites and other sites as well along the way. This is another site built three years later in 2013, Little St. Simons Island. This is the one example that we have where a bulkhead was removed. You can see the bulkhead on the left hand side of the screen. It was removed <clears throat> and sloped. The bank was sloped um, to about a two to two and a half, sometimes three uh, to one slope. And uh, same technique that's been used, oyster bags placed and native plants planted, and then monitoring associated with, with this project as well. And then the last example I want to show you is of a uh, land trust property, St. Simons Land Trust. This is their Cannons Point Preserve Living Shoreline on St. Simons Island. And uh, the reason I show you this is twofold. Uh, it was built in 2015, so five years old. Uh, these are very early construction uh, photos, as you can see. But um, one of the pictures taken after Irma in 2017 showed that uh, this site held up really well to the storm, to Irma. Uh, we saw that with all of our living shoreline sites. Um, none of them had any substantial damage that uh, was attributed to the storm itself. And uh, in this photograph, you can see the actual built structure all the way to the PVC in the marsh. And then the rest of this image shows natural marsh with no structure placed. And so this was uh, very characteristic of the entire shoreline and uh, really gave us uh, an insight uh, along with the other sites that we visited um, of how these do hold up against storms. Granted, that was one storm, but we do um, look at these sites after each significant impact. So more information can be found on our website. Now I want to transition to a beneficial use project that was constructed last year. Uh, this was Georgia's first thin layer placement project. We worked with the Army Corps of Engineers for a couple of years to develop this pilot project, which is really intended to look at an economically and environmental environmentally sensitive means to dredging a tidal creek. At the bottom of this image is Jekyll Creek, which is, was the shallowest point of the Intracoastal Waterway in Georgia, significantly shallow. And so the, there had been an interest to dredge this for a really long time. Finally, the funding came together and the Corps approached us to help determine if a thin layer placement project was suitable. Not having done this before, we were uh, interested in really thinking this through, um, understanding what other states have learned. Uh, we took that information and uh, the latest LIDAR images, and we determined that uh, we did have a five acre site, as you can see here, adjacent to Jekyll Creek, a five acre site where sediment was placed and to the northeast, another five acre site was um, set aside as the control site. And so um, in 2019, April of 2019, the Corps placed 5,000 cubic yards of material here, uh, not to exceed uh, three feet NAVD 88. And so those were restrictions placed on the project because we wanted to allow for tidal flow within this area. And so um, we worked with partners with the Nature Conservancy and Jekyll Island Authority to place the camera, as you can see the top right image, to view the site. Um, this was available in real-time viewing um, on our, from our website um, for about a year, actually. This is what placement looked like. 
they placed um, the extension of a pipe into approximately the middle of the five acre area. There were core fiber logs placed around the five acre area. And Georgia Southern University is working directly with the core to monitor the site for biological recruitment. So um, both plant communities and invertebrates uh, within this area. And we'll continue to monitor for another year. And this picture on the left was taken just last week. And so um, although we have not checked the box that this was a success yet, it's very good news that the growing season has brought about um, a regrowth of Spartina in some of the areas. There's a long way to go, but we're looking forward to working with the core on the outcomes of this project and, and potential projects in the future. And the last project I wanna to touch on is a partnership that we have had with the city of Tybee Island. Uh, the city has been very active in managing their beaches for the last several years, um, along with um, guidance from, from our program and other partners. And so um, these are some images to show you what uh, Tybee's dune system looked like um, and has looked like over the last few years prior to their nourishment. Um, and especially following Hurricanes Matthew and Irma, there was a lot of washout experience along their, their heavily trafficked areas. And so uh, they came to us uh, with permit requests for two different phases of placement of material. And one of those phases, which I'll focus on more so today, is um, from their pier south. And uh, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner that there's a, been a lot of flooding with uh, high tide floods. And they determined that their vehicular access points, you can see at this red arrow, were really acting as a conduit uh, to funnel water into the streets. And it just basically sat in the streets. And um, so they really put together a nice plan to um, re-nourish the areas uh, and really reconnect the dunes that were pre-existing on the shorefront. Here's a picture at the bottom center of um, the escarpments from a lot of the storms in an area with dunes. Um, but as you can see, there was a lot of washover area, not a substantial dune structure. So they um, began a project that um, moved 20,000 cubic yards of sand, that's approximately 1,200 dump trucks, um, from an upland source. And they basically reconstructed from the pier south and built a nice dune system, you can see at the bottom right, um, and protected it with sand fence, which has helped to attract even more sand. And so, in particular, Jan, just, just, just about another minute or so, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank this you. is the last slide. They, um, in particular, they uh, minimized their vehicular access and uh, cut that down from five locations to three. And at the three sites that they maintained, they have used a guardian retention system, which is basically sandbags with geotextile material with sand placed on top. The picture of the top actually the top right, excuse me, top left picture is one of the vehicular access points. And you can see the dune vegetation that was established therein um, after the dunes were, the sand was placed. They've just gotten underway with phase two, which is a partnership with the Army Corps where they purchased sand from the Corps and moved it around to create a dune system. So with that said, um, I will turn it over to Barbara for questions. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, we do have quite a few questions. If maybe Ben and Gary want to turn their cameras on so they can participate. I will start with uh, Shay Gibson, who asks, what portion of frequent flooding across the Southeast Coast? Um, for example, in Charleston, could be due to dredging or deepening projects along that, those regions. Gary, you out there? Hey, I forgot to turn on my camera. <laughs> so, 
Sorry about that. Did you get the question or should I repeat that? Or? No, I didn't. Sorry. Okay, so um, Shay Gibson asked, what portion of frequent flooding across the southeast coast, like in Charleston, for example, could be tied to dredging or deepening projects? I do not know the answer to that. Um, that actually, Jan is probably <laughs> to know more about the dredging and deepening. I, I don't know. So we actually have quite a few questions that relate to that. For example, um, are there places on the U.S. coast where the 20-year tidal cycle peak will have more impact than in other places, or is it pretty much uniform? So I guess these are questions that relate to subsidence and local variations. If anyone, any of y'all would like to comment on that? Actually, the subsidence and um, subsidence can occur on a variety of timescales. The tectonic sort of um, result um, then at Key West, what Ben was talking about is more what we would think of as tectonic. So it's a very long time scale, very slow process. As you go up the East Coast, we have changes in the land motion rate that are still an impact of the last deglaciation. So it's very long a time scale. In addition, you have to also worry about in some areas where neighborhoods were built, um, developed, in the 50s, 60s, uh, many times they were built on fill. So when you put in fill over time, it settles and compacts. So it, it would be, you, you might find that if your house was built in the 60s or 70s, like mine, uh, if you redid the survey, you might find you're lower than you were when you started. That's, a, that's something that will happen on decades. Um, as far as the tide portion, no, that definitely changes. So there is a pattern associated with the nodal period, the 18.6 year spring deep um, amplitude. And I think the best thing to do is uh, maybe we could send out um, to anyone who's interested a link to that Hawaii site that I mentioned. NOAA also has um, information on this. Um, Billy Sweet at NOAA uh, maintains these sorts of things. And I would suggest just look at the tide gauge closest to where you are, just like I showed you the one for St. Petersburg. There is a similar one for Charleston. Actually, anywhere there's a tide gauge, Phil has done these calculations. But um, no, you don't assume that they're the same everywhere, no. Would any of you like to comment on that, Jan? Something you've seen locally or? No, I, I will comment on the, the dredging, uh, which is not to answer the question, but um, for Georgia, we do have two ports that are actively maintained. And so um, specific to that, there are agreements worked out. For example, Tybee is a part of a federal project and has been since the 70s. And um, as such, there is a frequency of renourishment um, uh, to Tybee Island. but uh, a lot of factors have to be worked out for that to occur, of course. But it, it's a great question to ask about dredging impacts on the entire southeast. So, I, um, Ben, did you want to say something? I'll, I'll hold off for a second. I had one more thought. No, on no, this. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when I said I don't know about impacts due to changing tidal channels and dredging and such, um, I'm just not the expert on it. There are there are effects. If you change the channels, you change the tides. And so the tidal amplitude, and even when you talk about storm surge, there's a very important thing about what is the what we call the connectivity. As the sea level increases, does it have a pathway to inland? And so if you dredge a nice deep um, channel, you make it easier for the water to um, move in. So uh, there will definitely be impacts, and there are lots of things in the literature about if you change the tidal channels, you change the tidal amplitudes. So there will be impacts. I'm just trying to say that I'm not the expert on it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Frederick Bingham, who asks where we might be able to find the flooding days projection tool. Hey, Fred, how are you? I'm sorry, he's, he can't talk. No, <laughs> he can't. Fred and I were postdocs together in Hawaii many years ago. So, um, Fred, if you will 
if you will um, email me, or I think they're going to pass on questions in the chat to me. Um, I, I will send that to you. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can give it to you and anyone else who's interested. It's actually, if you want to try to search for it in yourself, I believe it's on the national, on the NASA sea level change team site. That was the group that it was created for. Okay, great. He says, thank you. Um, we have another question that talks, that asks if you could speak more about subsidence in Miami Beach. Well, of course, there's the, uh, the uh, tectonic impacts that Gary's talking about. But when you think about Miami Beach also, that it's, it's uh, landfill. It uh, really wasn't designed to have all those people and all those buildings on it, and it's landfill. And, and you build those big buildings, and over time, that land is going to compact and sink. And that's a definite contributor to some of the sea level rise problems in Miami Beach in particular. Great. And then we have another question um, from Al Sandrick, and it asks, so the increase in blue sky flooding in the southeast Kona's Atlantic Bight area, are we looking at SLR, AMO, or both? Uh, uh, I'm sure Gary will say yes. <laughs> 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 the, the, answer, the answer is yes. When you think about when you uh, think about the increasing uh, clear sky flooding, some of it's AMO, some of it's sea level rise, some of it is changes in the prevailing winds. All of these, when you think about you know, just what's happening over short time scales, in a few weeks, a few months, few seasons, few years, you have to think about the natural variability. And uh, in a very profound way, and, and Gary's long-term trends try to account for some of that. You notice they have a, an envelope that envelope on top is trying to include all of these natural effects as you go forward in the long term. And uh, we try to quantify those, but that's open questions, exactly how those things are gonna change over time, we don't know. We only use past estimates to make a statement about how the AMO, for example, is gonna be changing over time. So we don't know that those, you know, how accurate those envelopes or clouds that Gary has in his figure. Yeah, I'd just like to add um, two things, Ben, is that the the envelope that um, Phil uses, um, Ben's entirely right. This is based on past um, statistics. Basically, the, the best we can do essentially right now, um, the sorts of models and analyses that Ben's developing um, will improve that in the future. The um, The second thing is what Ben said in his talk is what I think he's um, dead on the right track, and I've been looking at similar things from a statistical point of view, is if you're at a coastal situation on a continental shelf, you know, the strength of the alongshore mean wind matters a lot. And I think that's where a lot of our set up and set down sort of issues come from, just like Ben was talking about um, in his presentation. Great, thank you. And for those of you who, um, if you open your chat window, you can see that the projection tool link has been posted. Um, I also have one more question um, from Sarah Bun Sandra Bundy, sorry. Uh, this is for Jan. Is thin layer placement a good option for smaller estuaries to use to protect against storm surges and sea level rise? That's a fabulous question, and um, I don't know the answer to that. We're still very early on in determining if this area is going to grow back. We want we want to maintain the wetland. Um, that is our overall goal, but also um, having a location to place sediment was a part of that goal. So we're still evaluating that, um, and I don't know if other states would um, would make a determination yet, likely so for those that have been doing thin layer placement for longer than Georgia, but we're very early in the stages here. Okay, thank you. Um, and I have a follow-up question for you, Jan. How, how do you guys um, incorporate the data from such projects such as what Ben and Gary are up to. How do you put that into your local plan for these um, engineering with nature projects? Um, we do 
we do account for uh, sea level rise projections where we can, and that's not just in planning for uh, these types of projects, but on a community level, uh, we are working with local jurisdictions to build that into their planning and their thinking. Um, so yes, that, that information is really important to us. It also helps to educate people when we are talking about what they are seeing on the ground with property owners daily um, to talk about some of their challenges with erosion. It gives us a great opportunity to build in what the science is telling us. And um, that's really important to have that information to carry to all aspects of what we do at coastal management. And what other data might be helpful to um, maybe improve the likelihood of success for these kinds of projects? Is that targeted to me, Barbara? I would guess just in general. I mean, it's it's about the application process. You know, you have this great information in terms of um, the research done on larger scale and in some cases even shorter time scales. And then how is that actually applied to to make progress in efforts of resilience and coastal hazard um, mitigation? I think it's, as I mentioned for us at the beginning of my presentation, there are data sets that we use throughout all of these. Um, sand sourcing is going to be even more critical moving forward than it has been. Uh, bathymetry data, and as I mentioned, not just near shore, but offshore and back barrier island bathymetry is really important. And we're looking at sites to um, put living shorelines in. The bathymetry of those smaller creeks is really essential to evaluating that, and we do not have it. And so um, shoreline change information, uh, LIDAR updates along the way, as well as ortho imagery, all of those are critical. And there, there are so many other data sets, but those really rise to the top when it comes to resiliency projects in Georgia. Uh, so great. Want, and we have, just want, Barbara, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, sorry, Gary. Sorry, Barbara. I just want to comment that all the data that Sequoia um, uh, collects is critical for the modeling efforts that we do in terms of not only validating the models, but when we do these predictions, we have to figure out how to start the climate system off. And these real-time uh, observational systems that Sequoia produces are critical for uh, not only confronting the model with observations to see how good they are, but how to initialize forecasts. So they're extremely useful to us. Great, thank you. And we have one last question, if we could squeeze that in here. Um, this is from Roger Pulise. Um, it says, it's for Jan, while loss of property is a significant focus on planning for resiliency, how are um, CZM agencies and local, local governments collaborating to plan for loss or mitigation of estuary and nursery habitats, including salt marsh, um, oyster um, farming, and supporting virtually all coastal fin fish and crustacean fisheries? Was that specific to uh, programs coordinating with local governments? Just in, in general here, um, you know, basically saying that although loss of property is an important component, um, how are you collaborating to also work for uh, just basically conserving these systems for their uses that we've been accustomed to? Right. Um, so we do. Uh, well, the, I'll speak to living shorelines. These are focused on oyster, um, oyster uh, enhancement. Um, and that is, of course, supportive of the fisheries overall, but it, it's just a small piece. And um, we recognize, of course, that property owners have rights. We have to work within that frame. Um, but at the same time, we've had a lot of interest from property owners that are, are are interested in living shorelines and want to do something to improve habitat. So that's a very small example um, of, of, of a way that we are able to work within the legal system to influence these types of projects. Um, we are continuing to work um, with a diverse group of stakeholders. Um, some of those are fisheries. Um, uh, biologists and uh, so you know I think with fisheries it's really baby steps for us to learn how we can um, build build that aspect into resiliency. Great well 
thanks everyone. We actually got through all the questions. Um, if, if participants come up with something else, please get in touch. We can forward it to the panelists. And we thank you for spending your lunch hour with us here. And Abby is coming back on. There she is. Um, all right, Abby, I'll, I'll let you close out. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much um, for joining us. And once again, thank you to the panelists. I thought this was a great presentation. Um, we'll be following up and posting the recording on the website. And if we have permission, we'll also post the PowerPoints on the website. Thank you guys for joining. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're here, standing by, happy to help. Thank All you, right, folks. Thanks, thank guys. Everyone. Have a great Tuesday. Thank you for finding, hi Abby. <laughs> She's just gonna tell Abby, thank you for finding that link. But, all right, nice Bye, meeting, folks. Barbara, Jan. Yep.